Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Capitalism Revisited, Responsible Enterprise. You are kindly requested to take a seat as the session will begin shortly. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome on stage Claudia Parzani. Good morning, and of course, welcome to Borsa Italiana. It's a great pleasure for me, and it's a great pleasure, of course, for all the team of Borsa Italiana. Grazie. Perfetto. Meglio. Uh, to host uh, this important event today, event on responsible capitalism. As you know, of course, here we are in, uh, in the house of uh, the corporate governance. Is uh, where the place where the modern vision of corporate governance has been created and developed with the concept and the evolution of the Italian corporate governance code. Okay, first of all, let me congratulate with Asonime, European Corporate Governance Institute, and Bocconi University. I have to say that the program that you have for these two days is really, really amazing. And I, I really think it because uh, you, you find uh, for the today's session uh, the most relevant topics uh, in the current discussion on corporate governance uh, and that, that they stimulate to look ahead. So congratulations on this point. And uh, I have to say that I found uh, very interesting uh, the way in which uh, they are presented, but also the connections uh, that you create uh, throughout the program. So I, I just uh, took the advantage of this uh, welcome uh, to leave you something uh, uh, on the corporate governance side uh, from me and uh, from the stock exchange. And uh, let me start with saying that we all know how difficult uh, and extraordinary and extremely challenging uh, are the times uh, that we are facing and uh, how the world is changing, uh, needs to change. and. Uh, the speed, how fast things are happening. And so I think that if there is one thing that in my mind has to happen is for sure that we have to change. We have to change the perspective, we have to change the approach on many things, on many, many things, corporate governance included. So I have three magic I would call magic, it's nice, and keywords that I use more and more often, and they are all relevant, I think, and I use them in the relevant and complex topics that I want to share with you today, 
uh, running slowly through the topics uh, that uh, you, um, you are going to discuss. The three words uh, that uh, I use more and more are flexibility. I have to say that if I can buy something, I buy, okay, but just one thing, I buy flexibility. And I buy flexibility means flexible approach, identifying solution, taking account of the context and the environment. The second one is something that uh, I, I call uh, the double L dimension. So for me, whatever I look uh, has to have a long-term and large vision. A perspective with a long-term horizon, which includes, of course, different perspectives and points of view. So inclusion in some way. The third one is coexistence instead of succession. And uh, I think that coexistence is giving us more and more opportunities and more possibilities and uh, to make the best use of the skills and all the experience. So today you will reflect on the most appropriate tools to deal with environmental, human and social impacts of companies comparing traditional tools with the new and innovative one. Here we are. I think that I will use flexibility and coexistence. As I say, I believe that it's really time to change our way of thinking, analyzing problems and finding solutions, adopting a flexible approach. And this, I think, that is true for us as individuals, as companies and as institutions. The available tools cannot be considered separately. We cannot look at them in silos. Rather, we need to look and analyze all the connections among them with a projection into the future. These ways of thinking will allow us to find the most appropriate tool or the coexistence of tools based on the context, the environmental and the interest to be considered. This approach will also allow us to be brave. Brave enough where needed to let go of solution from the past. We cannot take the risk of crystallizing solution or to choose solution that they are already obsoleted. You will discuss uh, benefit corporation. Regardless of the definition and corporate label, it really is time for every business to play a central role in society for the development of the communities and territories in which it operates. The multiple crises and unprecedented obstacles require companies to have an active role in facing these challenges, promoting change and contributing to a better world. And frankly, this is a business imperative. It is, the best, it is in the best interest of the companies to embrace this role, to remain competitive and attractive for stakeholders, for their clients, for their employees, for their pool of talents. And uh, in order to make a positive impact, uh, companies need to clear, clearly identify their raison d'être, their noble purpose, the reason for which they exist, and what society would lose without them. And I think that in this context, again, the double L dimension, long-term and large vision, is crucial. A long-term strategic perspective and a large and comprehensive vision able to include and to take account the expectation and needs of all the relevant stakeholders. When you will discuss the control and hazing mechanism that may contribute to pursue the long-term socially desirable actions, again, let's have in mind the strategic long-term and large vision and flexibility, taking into account that we have to look at things from different perspectives and to balance interest, frankly, for the benefit of our markets and overall growth. You will come to arrive to reflect on family businesses that certainly represent a key driver for sustainable business models. And I completely agree. And it's time for family businesses to promote a change, focusing on coexistence instead of succession. We are looking at corporates that they have four, five generations. And I think that we have to make the best of the skills and experience of different generations. 
let's stop to look at the stereotypes uh, like the most experienced uh, are the ones uh, that they have the context, uh, the youngest are the ones that have the energy. Let's look around the people that we have on the table and make sure that you use the best uh, talents. And so we go for diversity of experience, uh, diversity of skills, uh, and uh, in this coexistence, uh, we find uh, the way to get the best uh, from this company. I, I would like to close uh, reminding you that and focusing on the central words uh, for the first, uh, this first day, that is responsible enterprise. Our countries, our societies, our people need, need responsible enterprises. Moving toward a new model of capitalism, uh, revisited capitalism. And we said that the world uh, has changed and is continuously changing and uh, the new challenges are ahead of us. We are going to face uh, very difficult times and companies are required to respond to these challenges by playing a more central role and making a significant contribution to the world and the society. Flexibility, double L dimension, long-term and large vision, coexistence instead of succession, I believe that they are crucial. And uh, last, but not least, it is important, again, to have courage, to be brave, to let go of well-established and well-known solutions where they are no longer appropriate. I wish you to make the best of today and tomorrow and hope that you are inspired to face future challenges with always just one big ambition, that is to live a better world. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome on stage Herman Demps. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Let me first say that I was very impressed with the words that Claudia uh, pronounced and I share fully your uh, comments. I'm very proud and very honored as uh, chairman of uh, ECGI to welcome this distinguished audience at this two-day conference. I'm also proud that ECGI can be co-organizer with these prestigious uh, organizations here in Milan, Asonomy and Bocconi. I must say, I've been told that uh, the preparatory work has been very intense. And I know it's custom to thank people at the end of the conference. I would already start by thanking the people that have prepared this conference. And I'd like to mention Annabella, Elisabetta, Barbara, and Matea for all the work that they have done. <laughs> Capitalism Revisited. That is the title of this conference. And indeed, the business world and the investment world are today at real crossroads. And I know you've heard this many, many times. And that's why I use the word real crossroads. We have very often talked about crossroads and choices we had to make, but now we are at real crossroads. And the question in front of us is, what direction will companies and capital markets take in the future? In the past, the business and the investment world have been overall a good thing for the development of the world and the development of society. But today, the world and society are changing 
That means that if business and capital markets want to continue playing a good role, they have to change with the world. And you know the changes. Climate is changing. Inequality is growing, and that's a real concern. Diversity in the world is increasing. Globalization is taking a step back, and we are moving to a new global new world that may exist in different blocks, not in one global world. People have different expectations about their life, and they want a meaningful life. They just don't want a work for people that they don't know, shareholders that they don't know. They want to do something for their, themselves. And customers are demanding products, and they want a sustainable world to live in. So business and investment world have to respond to these critical changes. And the old models of governance, which were very much rule-driven, do this, don't do that, will need to change. I like to talk about corporate governance 3.0. And we have had two previous types of governments. The type of governments which I call governance 1.0 is the governance where everything was focused on solving problems between managers and shareholders. And that is the world that came about some 50 years ago after famous articles by Milton Friedman saying we should be focusing solely on the shareholder. The second type of uh, corporate governance that came about came about very much in Europe where we had issues of majority shareholders sometimes called reference shareholders and minority shareholders. How do we deal with these different type of shareholders? Today, and I think it has a lot to do with the COVID uh, period, we're moving back to the corporation as a concept, as a whole, as an institution that brings together many players, many stakeholders. And so we are trying to look for a corporation and a corporate model and a governance model that can deal with these stakeholders. That is what we are going to discuss today and tomorrow. I hope you will enjoy a very fine conference. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome on stage Luca Garavoglia. Good morning. With the organization of uh, the two-day event on responsible capitalism, Asonime aims to support and encourage the growing commitment by market forces and civil society towards social and environmental challenges. The ambition of this evolution needs to be supported not only by the development of adequate policies and practices, but also by a sort of refoundation, or at least serious revisitation, of the cultural basis of corporate economics. 
For these reasons, we have decided to unite with the European Corporate Governance Institute and Bocconi University in organizing this event so as to provide a forum for a lively dialogue between very distinguished academics and practitioners on the evolving role of responsible enterprises and investors. Today, the focus will be on the corporate aspect with a number of key leaders of Italian companies, both large and medium-sized, presenting their experience project in the area of sustainability following an academic introduction. The discussion will focus on three issues which are very relevant in the Italian context. First, the development of company purpose, also considering the opportunities offered by the Italian legal framework for benefiting corporations. Second, the role of controlling owner and the use of enhanced voting power as a tool for improving long-term orientation and corporate strategy. And third, the specific situation concerning family enterprises and how their governance can evolve to support and preserve their commitment towards sustainable success. It's not by chance that this conference is hosted by Borsa Italiana, as capital markets can play a key role in supporting the evolution of responsible enterprises. Climate change, social responsibility, together with digitalization, require a large amount of investments, and this calls for a well-organized and an efficient market for, for risk capital. In this respect, the Italian context is facing profound and long-term underdevelopment. It is due to the structural weakness of the Italian ecosystem, such as the inefficiency of the judicial system, the uncertainty and variability of the corporate tax regime, the underdevelopment of industry for financial services, as well as cultural reluctance by the corporate world to fill the transparency gap required to access capital markets. But a relevant role in perpetuating the underdevelopment of the Italian stock exchange was played also by the, the evolution of the domestic regulative framework and supervisory approach. Both of them failed to adapt to the growing competition by more dynamic and flexible national system. Currently, we are facing in Europe a new imposing wave of regulation addressing sustainability issues. They will set ambition disclosure duties as those provided by the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive and even behavioral rules, such as the pro those provided by Purpose Due Diligence Directive. As a matter of fact, while sustainability challenges affect the economy and society on a global scale, Europe is playing a leading role in the development of policies and best practices. This approach creates opportunities, but also risks for the European economy. The new rules will deeply affect corporate life, increasing costs and requiring big organizational changes. It is important that their implementation be gradual and proportionate, and that the whole regulatory system be maintained balanced and affordable. This means, particularly in the Italian context, that a comprehensive revision of the current set of rules should be envisaged in order to avoid undue competitive disadvantages for companies and to further discourage their access to capital markets. One way to ensure the balance of the new regulatory framework is to promote a larger flexibility of rules and to enhance corporate autonomy in establishing their government arrangements and procedures. To address the new challenges, responsible enterprises should be allowed to freely determine the allocation of government power, providing the necessary transparency of their choices and the underlying rationale. It will then be up to the market, including investors, but also other relevant shareholders and stakeholders, to assess the outcome of the different solution proposed, not only in terms of economic result, but also for the impact of society as a whole. The other way is to progress substantially towards the European Capital Market Union. The mix of policy goals set by the European Union Combining the pressure for a structural step up towards social and environmental sustainability with the need to promote economic growth has to be supported by the real integration of European capital markets. This means overcoming the current fragmentation created by the lack of a true common set of rules and supervisory approaches, 
even in areas where maximum harmonization was pursued. The introduction of the new rules on sustainability risks emphasizes this problem, as they rely on the different national institutional frameworks for key aspects of their implementation, such as for their enforcement, while in Europe coexist very different dis disciplines and cultural habits. Asonima strongly supports the move toward a single supervisor for the European capital market and giving more powers and stronger governance independent to ESMA on the model of the European Central Bank. The current trend of consolidation of European stock exchanges led by the network created by Euronext could also contribute to, to overcoming fragmentation, not only throughout, uh, through a larger pool of liquidity, but also through stronger, a stronger convergence of the listing rules. To sum up, we are all facing big challenges in which the long-term need for radical transformation meets with severe strategic and conjunctural tensions. In this framework, corporations are called to play a key role in driving transformation while maintaining their ability to create economic and social value. In order to carry out this function, it is fundamental to guarantee a sound institutional and regulatory framework and a coherent policy vision. Asonim hopes this conference will provide valuable inputs in support of such an evolution. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome on stage, Colin Meyer. Good morning. As we've already heard, the world is fundamentally changing. With it, business is changing. Business is the most important institution in our lives. It clothes, feeds and houses us, it employs us and it invests our savings. It's the source of economic prosperity and the growth of nations around the world. But there's also a growing recognition that it's a source of environmental degradation, destruction of nature, inequality, social exclusion, and mistrust. And business is changing with this. It's increasingly realizing that its purpose is not simply to profit. It's recognizing that the means as well as the money matter. The source as well as the size of the profit matter. It matters whether business benefits from environmental degradation. It matters whether profits come at the expense of people. It matters whether shareholder value destroys societal values. And it matters because societal values create shareholder value. Business knows this. Investors know it. And regulators know it and are responding. Nowhere more so than in Italy. It was the first European country to legislate on benefit corporations. Its companies are adopting purpose and sustainability in their bylaws. They're incorporating corporate governance codes in their businesses and sustainability in their strategy, risk policy, remuneration and reporting. But it's not enough. B Corps have been great. A public purpose alongside private profit is great. The massive growth in numbers of B Corps in the US and Europe is great. The incorporation of public benefit in law and purposes and bylaws are great. But they're not enough. They've not done enough. Why? 
because the world hasn't changed enough. The problem is not, as Keynes said, in the long run, we're all dead. The problem is that we'll all be dead in the short run. We simply cannot wait on the mass of small B Corps to become bigger, or the small number of large B Corps to become more numerous. We must boil the oceans, because otherwise the oceans will boil us. What's more, we're going backwards, not just forwards. Greenwashing, purpose washing, ESG bashing, woke jokes are no joke. They reflect a deep-rooted cynicism, antagonism, and hostility, which will bring responsibility and sustainability to a grinding halt. That's what's happening in some states, in the United States, or should I say the un-United States of America. And the reason is that the backlash is quite justified. ESG is a problem, not a solution, worse in many respects than its CSR predecessor. It's inconsistent, unverified, unassured, and unaudited. Purpose statements are usually corporate promotion, and sustainability is simply unsustainable. Why? Because the existing system is incoherent. You cannot have a system that presumes you will do well by doing good. You don't. You often do better by doing bad. You cannot presume that in the long run, the virtuous are rewarded. They are not, because they can't get there. They cannot implement the long-term policies that are needed without being undermined by the short-term behaviour of others. You cannot assume that competition, regulation or government will sort it out. They haven't and they won't. You must have a system that is coherent. You have to live up to one simple fact. So long as it's profitable to benefit at the expense of others, it will go on happening. You can have as much non-financial reporting, material risk assessment, investor engagement, stewardship as you like. But if it's profitable to make money out of others, people will do it and compete to do more of it. Corporate purpose gets you nowhere if you do not recognize what it is. It's not simply a statement of a company's North Star, its mission, its vision, its enlightenment, and its halo. That is just flannel and flam. It must have real substance to have any significance. It must be a real challenge in terms of corporate ambition and credible proof that a company does not profit at the expense of others. What is a corporate purpose? And what is the purpose of business? The purpose of a business is the reason why it exists, why it's created, and its reason for being. The purpose of business is to solve problems. Problems that you and I face as individuals, societies, and the natural world. And to do so in a particular way. A way that is commercially viable and profitable. Because business is not philanthropy. It's about making money. But it's also about how money is made. It's made from producing solutions, not problems for others. So the purpose of a business is to produce profitable solutions for the problems of people and planet, not profiting from producing problems for either. Why? Because if companies produce profitable solutions and don't profit from producing problems, then they profit from problem solving not creating, from solving a problem, not creating them. Then and only then do we align purpose with prosperity, 
money with morality, and sustainability with incentive compatibility. How does one do this? The short answer is through law, ownership, governance, measurement, incentives, finance, and investment. The long answer is by aligning every part of a capitalist system with profitably solving, not creating problems. Companies need to have owners that take responsibility for ensuring that their firms profit from producing solutions, not problems, over the long run as well as the short run. Governance needs to ensure that every part of a business owns its part of the corporate purpose and knows what problems it is there to solve profitably. It needs to empower everyone from the board to the shop floor to do exactly that. It needs to measure its performance against fulfilling its purpose of solving problems. It needs to measure the profit it derives from doing so and incur the costs of correcting the failures when it doesn't do so. Finance needs to provide the resources to allow companies to deliver on their purposes and steward them to do it profitably. And companies need to partner with governments in investing in solving the world's biggest challenges profitably because business cannot and should not solve them on its own. But to do this, there has to be a better alignment between interests of governments that supposedly are interested in the public benefit and the private sector interested in profit. Will it take a decade to achieve this? No, it can't and it need not. It can be achieved in a matter of a few years. We have the laws, ownership, governance, measurement, incentive, finance and investment are ready to do it. They are public benefit corporations and impact investment. But it's no use B Corps being cute things that some small companies do and impact investing being restricted to the impact funds that invest with a conscience. All companies must be public benefit corporations that have a public benefit as well as a profit purpose and profit from producing solutions, not problems. And all institutional investors need to be impact investors who invest in and steward companies to produce profit from solving, not creating problems. We, and Italy in particular, have the tools to achieve a systemic change, but all the Italian corporate and institutional investor sectors need to use them, and all the world needs to adopt and implement them. Let me conclude by abusing my privilege as a speaker and preempt some of the panel discussion which follows this by giving a very brief response to the, some of the topics that I believe will be debated. That will give the panel members the opportunity to disagree with everything I've said. Firstly, how should sustainability issues be incorporated in a company's strategy, risk policy, remuneration and governance? My answer would be through putting a purpose of profitably solving problems without profiting at the expense of others at the heart of all of its strategy, risk policy, remuneration and governance and ensuring that they are all aligned. Second, how should companies communicate with relevant stakeholders and how are their views brought to the board? My answer would be through ensuring that everyone in the organisation, from the board to the shop floor, own their part of the corporate purpose, understand it and are empowered to implement it. That way they are entrusted to promote profitable problem solving and engage with their relevant stakeholders in solving their problems. The reason that delegation is so important is that the board cannot possibly understand what is going on throughout its organisation, let alone in, in its entire ecosystem. It's those on the shop floor who can and do build the relations of trust with others who need that delegated authority. And it's for the board to ensure that the right values and culture 
pervade the organization to allow delegation of authority, employees to be entrusted, and real two-way communication to take place between the board and the shop floor. Finally, should companies adopt purposes in their bylaws and adopt benefit corporation status? Yes, but with two provisos. The first is that the purpose is meaningful in terms of profitable problem solving, and secondly, that there is a credible and irreversible commitment to its delivery through all companies adopting public benefit corporation status. Let me illustrate with two examples. The first is a water company in the UK that two years ago incorporated its purpose in its Articles of Association. It's been one of the worst water polluters in releasing untreated sewage, accounting for a quarter of all serious water incidents in the UK in 2021. So much so that 40% of the River Cam in Cambridge flowing alongside those punting beside beautiful King's College is estimated to be sewage that the company has to start discharged. The notion of filthy lucre has rarely been so appreciate, uh, apposite and the limitations of simply relying on incorporation of a corporate purpose in a company's articles never been so e evident. The second is a Swedish bank that has adopted a clearly defined purpose of putting its customers' interest first and setting up the ownership, governance, measurement and incentives to do that. Fifty years ago, it inverted the traditional structure of a bank. It switched from being a bank run from the top to one that delegated decision-taking from the board to individual branches of the bank. So much so that the mantra of the bank is now that the branch is the bank. It eliminated bonuses and financial incentives and insti instead instilled the culture and values of the bank in everyone, from the board to the shop floor. And above all, it put trust in those at the bottom of the organisation to promote and uphold the corporate purpose. They, in turn, built relations of trust with their customers and the bank was transformed from a traditional transactional bank selling products at the highest possible price to a relationship bank, growing and profiting as its corporate borrowers grew and profited. The result has been that the bank has consistently been one of the most stable, profitable and highest shareholder return banks with the highest levels of customer satisfaction of any bank in Europe for the past 40 years. Well, generally, the foundation-owned firms, enterprise foundations of Denmark, Germany and elsewhere, Bertelsmann, Bosch, Carlsberg, Ikea, Musk and Velox are examples of firms with owners committed to purposes. They are some of the largest and most successful firms in the world, and they illustrate the potential for Europe to be at the forefront of leading the transformation of capitalism around the world without relying on a jungle of regulations to do it. In sum, so long as foul pay flows from false profits, then corporate purpose and commitments are not worth the paper they are not written on. Put a stop to it. Ensure that profit flows from solving, not causing problems, and that the required ownership, governance, measurement incentives are in place to do it. And the prosperity of businesses and their investors will be everyone's prosperity. It is inspiring for everyone, for employees, for customers, for communities, and for investors. It's the way to recruit talent, create customer loyalty, promote societal support, and reward investors. Don't trust me. Do it. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome on stage Jennifer Hill. Good morning, everyone. And uh, if 
if I could just thank Asonime and Bocconi and ECGI for the invitation to be here. Um, it is wonderful to be in Milan again. And I'd also like to congratulate the organisers for the wonderful timing of this conference. I woke up this morning to read the New York Times and uh, an article in the New York Times telling us that the founder of Patagonia, Yvonne Schumacher, had just transferred the uh, $3 billion outdoor apparel company to a trust that was uh, organised to protect the company's values, uh, the Patagonia Purpose Trust. And he made the comment, Earth is now our only shareholder. So I think that's a great um, point to start with. Um, I want to go back just to the global financial crisis for a moment. And John Plender from the Financial Times said, business has a legitimacy problem. And I think our conversation today about uh, business purpose, about benefit corporations, is very much a contemporary response to this legitimacy problem. And in giving this commentary today on Colin's wonderful presentation, I, I just want to ask four questions. And uh, I I'll start with my first. Uh, my first question is, what is the purpose of business purpose? And where does it fit within corporate law theory and history? And I'm going back even further here uh, to probably the most famous corporate law text ever written uh, by professors Burley and Means, uh, the US text, The Modern Corporation and Private Property in 1932. And interestingly enough, they wrote a very complex, very nuanced book about business uh, in The Modern Corporation and Private Property. And they saw the corporation as a profoundly ambiguous body that straddled um, public law at one end and private law at the other end. And they said, it's uncertain which way business will go in the future. And it can shift between those two ends uh, of the spectrum. Now, of course, as Herman Dimes has told us this morning, since the 1970s and 1980s, we've had a profoundly private conception, an anti-regulatory and private conception of the corporation, uh, where the one and only problem, really, of the corporation was viewed as being misalignment of interests between shareholders and managers and the problem of underperformance. How do we incentivise managers to make lots and lots of money for shareholders? During the period that this has been the dominant model of the corporation, we've also seen corporations gain power and gain rights. Uh, and two US uh, cases that are very prominent in this area, the Citizens United case of 2010 and Hobby Lobby of 2014, giving really significant rights to shareholders. Now, Colin's presentation, of course, uh, comes out of this very well-known British Academy study on the purpose of the modern corporation. And I think that it's so important because it is a major course correction from the Milton Friedman type approach of the private conception of the firm. Uh, the approach we're discussing today uh, takes a public conception of the corporation rather than seeing it as just a completely private entity. It doesn't talk about corporate rights as much as it talks about corporate responsibilities to society. Um, it also recognises that we have multiple problems in corporate law today. It's not just about how do we you know, have well-performing companies. It's also about how do we prevent companies from causing harm to society and to the planet? How do we provide guardrails uh, around negative externalities. And business purpose is one of the tools that is being considered at this time to try to make this major course correction in the way that we think about businesses. So my second question, what are the implications of business purpose, not in the, you know, non-meaning way that Colin said some companies will just put it in in a very superficial way, but in a genuinely embedded business purpose. What are the implications? Well, as Colin told us, it means that it's not just about making profits anymore, it's about how you make those profits. 
And business purpose in this respect ties in with many contemporary debates, uh, ESG debate, corporate culture debate, stakeholder protection and voice, corporate reputation, and particularly sustainability. And I think that um, in its most powerful incarnation, business purpose is all about how do you create positive externalities rather than negative externalities? How can business do that? And that ties in very well, I think, with a famous quotation from Thomas Sigsgaard, uh, who said, you know, if you want to be truly sustainable, don't make anything, don't do anything. But the second most sustainable way is to make something very useful to solve a problem that hasn't been solved. And that lies very much at the heart of Colin's conception and the um, British Academy's conception of corporate purpose, I think. Business purpose isn't just a matter of corporate theory. As Colin has mentioned, it is being embedded now in Italian law. And it's also front and centre of the UK Corporate Governance Code and the UK Stewardship Code. And that matters internationally uh, because those codes have been incredibly important in transmitting norms around the world. Uh, we tend to think of the US as being uh, a dominant transmitter of corporate law. I don't think that is the case. The last 20 years, the UK has been the dominant uh, transmitter of norms in the corporate realm. So my next question is, what does irresponsible capitalism look like? Uh, because sometimes it's good to get a really close-up view of what we're trying to find an antidote for. And so one of the most important things that comes out of recent developments, I think, is the idea that incentives that we have had in place for the last 30 or so years designed to redress that one problem that under the law and economics model was the big problem of corporate law, corporate underperformance, that those incentives to make more profits have actually exacerbated the second problem that we are now recognising, the problem of negative externalities that can then result in irresponsible capitalism that harms society and harms the planet. So I want to give you a couple of examples of what I think are very good examples of irresponsible capitalism from my own country, Australia. I have travelled far to be here today. Um, and the first of those examples comes from the Commonwealth Bank of Australia, the largest, most iconic bank in Australia. Um, the Commonwealth Bank of Australia was found to have engaged in conduct which breached a number of laws um, involving, um, what did they involve? They, they breached many, many things, let me tell you. Um, anyhow, there was a study that was set up by APRA, uh, who is the Australian Prudential Regulator, and APRA looked into these breaches, and the most significant of the breaches were very, very, very severe breaches. They were money laundering and anti-terrorism laws. So APRA, in its report of what had gone wrong, with the Commonwealth Bank's business model, it identified a number of key problems. The first of these was a defective corporate culture. And it was a corporate culture that, interestingly, uh, the regulators said everybody was actually too complacent and too friendly in this organisation. People were so pleased with the profitability that they didn't ask questions. They didn't ask that important question that Colin told us you need to ask, how are you making these massive profits? The second problem that the regulator identified was the problem of perverse remuneration incentives. Incentives that encouraged employee conduct, incentives that patted everyone on the back for making huge profits. And of course, the Australian banks weathered the global financial crisis very well, so they, they felt pretty pleased with themselves. Um, and so these perverse incentives in remuneration frameworks were very important. Thirdly, um, the report said that financial success at the bank had dulled the senses of the bank and its managers to non-financial risks. Um, 
Now, we know that non-financial risks today are often also financial risks. Certainly, the big institutional investors know that. Uh, but in the Commonwealth Bank, there was not recognition of the fact that some of the activities that the bank was undertaking uh, were actually uh, encouraging and permitting money laundering and anti-terrorism. And then the final really important question I think that the report uh, asked, it said every organisation should have it embedded in its DNA, this question for every employee we might be able to do this, but should we do it? Should, is this something that a responsible business would engage in? And so that's something that has to be injected into an organisation's DNA. And corporate purpose can potentially go some way towards doing that. The second scandal or the second example of irresponsible capitalism arose in 2020, 2021, with Rio Tinto, one of the world's largest mining companies. It is dual listed in London and in Australia. And um, someone should have asked that question at Rio Tinto of should we do this? Because Rio Tinto engaged in a blasting exercise in Western Australia in the Dukin Gorge. Uh, it was very profitable blasting uh, exercise because it was looking for high quality iron ore. It was very valuable and it was good for profitability. However, it also destroyed a 46,000 year old Aboriginal cultural heritage site. And it was said that it caused indescribable grief to the relevant Aboriginal communities. Now, ultimately this unfolded as an example of uh, transnational shareholder activism the institutional investors uh, were not happy that this occurred, and it's a very interesting example of institutional investor activism. But the, the actions of Rio Tinto in relation to the Dukin Gorge blasting scandal were said to constitute a potent global symbol of the growing importance of ESG investment and the growing importance of companies having a moral purpose at their core. There are many challenges to purpose being an effective guardrail or being an effective antidote to irresponsible capitalism. And Colin has um, referred to many of them, but I have some of them up there on the screen. And these are challenges that we need to overcome to reach the sorts of goals that Colin talked about in his presentation. Um, some of the challenges are that there seem to be different meanings out in the um, ecosystem about what purpose means. And that's um, also, I think, contributing to that is the fact that we use corporate purpose in corporate law in a number of different contexts. And so Ed Rock and Paul Davies have said, you know, what does it mean in this context? The, the second, I think, um, important challenge is that the pursuit of profit is still hard-baked into business communities' models. And this is something that Dorothy Lund and um, Elizabeth Pullman in their wonderful uh, article on the corporate governance machine, which will receive an award tomorrow, um, they make this point and they say that, you know, in fact, benefit corporations have sidelined doing good and that's not good enough. We need to change the whole of the business community. And also benefit corporations, you know, still come from our old model of the corporation. Another problem is the idea that managerial control and co-option of business purpose is a possibility. And that leads to the spectre of organisational hypocrisy, such as in the, the company that Colin spoke about that was polluting uh, the River Cam while it was saying how committed it was to greening the planet. So that's a real danger, the idea of non-credible commitments and greenwashing, and we have to have ways to deal with that. So accountability is going to be the great challenge. Uh, can we rely on ESG shareholder activism for that kind of accountability? Uh, for example, in the Rio Tinto uh, situation, 
Well, perhaps in some examples, but most institutional investors are value investors. They are not ethical investors. They are in it to make money. We're also seeing anti-ESG resolutions and political pushback, particularly, as Colin mentioned, in the US. And although we are seeing changes in executive compensation to try to shift towards this new model um, of sustainable, long-term, purpose-filled business, um, it's of limited use so far, and the metrics are still an issue. So purpose, business purpose, has an important role, but it can't do all the heavy lifting on its own. But one thing that I do think can be very valuable coming out of uh, business purpose is this idea that it can create and manage culture. And Edward, Edgar Schein has said the only thing of real importance that leaders do is to create and manage culture. And I think that everything Colin has said in his presentation leads to that end. These changes must be led from the top down in business. Um, they must be real. They cannot be superficial. They cannot be examples of um, non-credible commitments. They cannot be examples of organisational hypocrisy. So I do think that business purpose has an important role in that shift that we're engaged in. And so with that, I'm going to uh, pass over to our panellists and I'm really interested to hear what they say is going on in the real world. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome on stage the moderator of session one, Business Purpose and Benefit Corporations, Margherita Bianchini, together with panel participants Michele Crisostomo, Cosimo Pacciani and Andrea Sironi. Thank you. Welcome now to the to our panel. Uh, following this uh, very inspirational part of the conference, uh, led by Professor Meyer, and uh, the key word, uh, the key concept of uh, Professor Meyer uh, relation are alignment of uh, all the parts of capitalism. Coherence uh, of purpose, strategy, risk, and remuneration policies. It's a big challenge, not only for the private sector, but also for the legal framework. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, for being here our very distinguished panelists, Michele Grisossomo, Chair of ANEL. Andrea Sironi, Chair of Assicurazioni Generali. And Mr. Cosimo Pacciani, Head of the Research Hub of Poste Italiane. Thank you. We will organize the discussion into rounds, uh, following our alphabetic order to start, and each panelist will have seven, eight minutes to answer in a very informal way. And uh, uh, th this session is dedicated to the topic of purpose benefit court model, uh, which represents a step, a further step to a responsible capitalism. And now we have uh, to answer in coherence uh, with uh, the, this two-day event and how can purpose and uh, business strategy uh, be part of this changement and this evolution. And to this regard, I would like to ask to you, to you all, first of all, we will start with Mr. Grisostomo, 
How are sustainability issues incorporated in the strategy, risk policy, remuneration policy and governance in your company? And to this regard, and as an answer of a very important part uh, raised from Professor Meyer and Professor Hill too, do you envisage communication channels with relevant stakeholders and in such case, how are their views brought to the board in order to be coherent with this uh, from the board to the floor design proposed by Professor Meyer? The floor is yours. Okay, good morning everybody and thanks for this uh, very complex question actually that uh, allows me to uh, go through what we do in terms of uh, um, embracing a sustainable strategy and to break it down into whatever we do in our organization trying to achieve what uh, um, has been said before, the fact that we try to solve problems for people, bringing them electricity in the most uh, efficient way, trying to minimize the environmental impact, and uh, to do it also profitably, hmm? which is, I think, uh, the big challenge of a, a company like Enel, which is uh, uh, in a sector that has complexities, and in respect of which, as we all know, there is a, a very strong, solid, and I think irreversible trend towards the uh, energy transition. And in this respect, since uh, 2015, NL has been actually undertaking this uh, um, commitment towards the um, energy transition, starting a process where all the aspect of the governance on one side and the organization of our company on the other side has been actually um, really uh, aligned to this uh, purpose. Let's introduce this term that I think will be <laughs> reconsidered several times in, uh, in all of this discussion, I think. In this respect, uh, we have been starting from considering that uh, the, uh, a model where we have uh, flexibility, and uh, this is a major word, as Claudia said, uh, and I agree with that, flexibility in the way we develop mm, the power generation. So starting from large scale projects, considering that uh, working on smaller scale projects, which are flexible from uh, a geographical point of view, we can put the renewables everywhere in the world, the wind and soil and sun are everywhere. We can have a different uh, uh, time to EBITDA type of uh, um, structure for smaller projects. So in a two, three years time, we can really put a solar plant or a wind farm into uh, producing something which is rele relevant to our EBITDA. So again, going from larger projects, the big plants, big thermal plants, to smaller scale type of projects. And of course, with a totally different environmental impact. And we have been discovering, due to the fact that we have a, a fundamental enabling factor, which is technology, first of all, and digitization as a pillar of the strategy on the other side, we have been discovering that actually this is profitable. Mm? So again, trying to sort out a problem, which is the energy paradigm based on uh, thermal generation in big plants, which means that you will be really depending on the territory, you will be depending on the resource, on the fossil fuels, which all the dependencies that will be deriving, and of course we are all experiencing what it means in a dramatic way. So starting from this model, we have been actually going through a model, becoming really an early leader in the energy transition in the global space, so not just in Italy, but in all the countries where we are present, and uh, we've been discovering that actually developing renewables, relying on digitization to make grids ready to host several you know, thousand of sources rather than a few big plants, and then working on uh, electricity services for clients, pushing them you know, softly to sort out the concrete problems, how I heat my home, how I move around in the city, how I can uh, light up, in a way, my streets with the public uh, you know, illumination. Well, I will be sorting all these very concrete problems through an electricity dimension which takes care of the environment, so we work on renewables, that they will be leading to solutions which are efficient in terms of use of the energy. 
Mm? So again, flexibility has become the driver through technology and digitization in order to support the development of renewables and changing radically our business model. Is it sustainable? Yes. Is it profitable? Yes. So that's probably what we have achieved over time. What it means in terms of uh, overall organization of our company? Of course, a sustainability risk for us is a business risk. Mm -hmm. And uh, a sustainability target should be a business target. In this respect, uh, the basic you know, element we rely on for developing our strategy, for planning, for, for doing our you know, business plan exercise, is uh, to try to cross priorities, which are business priorities, with the priorities which are stakeholders' priorities. Trying to understand when you run a business that goes into the house of, uh, we have uh, in the world uh, 76 million of clients. Mm? So we go in the house of 76 million of people. When you have uh, 2.2 million of kilometers of grids, mm? so that's the dimension of NL. If you have a business like this, you have a strong impact on people. You have a strong impact on communities. So you have to listen what people need. You have to listen what the local communities would like to have in terms of balancing the need of having the security of the electricity supply with the fact that this should be compatible with a very low environmental impact and potentially with a positive social, you know, effect in terms of allowing small businesses to grow, allowing families to be able to uh, rely on affordable electricity in their home. So that's the way we have been uh, developing the strategy, crossing the needs, the business needs, so our shareholders' needs, I would like you to make profits, with our stakeholders' needs. And this um, is, uh, uh, in a way, represented in what we call a sustainability matrix. Hmm? So we have these metrics that will be allowing to identify those business targets that will be at the same time maximizing what our stakeholders would like to see from us. That's the way we identify our targets for building our business plan. So again, we discover that our local communities are happy if we set up renewables, sources, that can have a, a good impact from an environmental point of view, and that through digitized grids, we will be putting the um, businesses, small businesses, big businesses, we're putting you know, families in a situation where they can have flexibility in access to electricity at an affordable cost. All of this, so sustainability matrix, uh, the materiality analysis, we make a sort of, uh, we wait, of course, all priorities to understand what is the business target that will be maximizing also the result for stakeholders. This, of course, will be having a reflection also on the way we approach risks. As I said, uh, for us, uh, sustainability risks are business risks, which means that we will be combining the analysis in the way the board will be giving guidelines on the internal control and the monitoring of the risk tools. We will be making this very clear so that, uh, again, the way we approach the risk is uh, a combination, an integration between a sustainability risk and business risk. And I'll make an example of this. A clear risk for us, for instance, today, is that we don't find people which are sufficiently skilled and are properly skilled to support the energy transition where we are putting all our efforts. So people we being able to work on uh, climate analysis, on uh, um, renewables developments, on uh, digitization, the shortage of people with the right skills, I think is a problem for a lot of industries. For us, is a big issue. Mm? How do we play with this? This is clearly a business risk mm? that has to do with the social element. So we are going into the S dimension of DSG that we need to address firstly through social type of uh, impact we tend to find uh, through a number of projects uh, in Italy. We have uh, really, um, for instance, I don't know, the, 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 the project with Alice on the development of the people that will be able to work on these projects. But the point is that you go from a social issue that you know is a business issue, you have to work with social tools in order to address a business issue. That's part of our strategy. 
Then the remuneration policy. You know, of course, uh, I totally agree with what has been said in, uh, in the introductory um, speeches about the fact that we need to um, work throughout the whole tools we have from a governance point of view to align our business you know, uh, objectives with, again, uh, ESG objectives. So remuneration po policy is quite key. So we have in our short-term uh, incentive plan for top management a 30% of the plan which is uh, linked to sustainability uh, goals. So in the short term, we have the safety and we have uh, a, a, an indicator of the quality of our service as, again, uh, customers at the center, of course, of our business model through the number of complaints we receive from class customers. Then in the LTI, we have, again, a 20% of the LTI which has to do with the uh, sustainability targets. First one is quite crucial for us, which is the reduction of scope one GHG's emission. Hmm? The second one has to do with diversity. So we would like that at least 50% of uh, people that will be going through the process for uh, uh, accessing to top management positions are women. Hmm? And that's again a, a target, you know, a, a KPI in our, in our LTI for, for top management. Then we have a governance structure that will be making all of this becoming real. We have a corporate governance and a sustainability committee in our board. Then I go to the finance framework. Finance framework, we have been the first in the world to issue sustainability-linked bonds, which uh, are quite a, a new asset class, which has also been uh, introduced uh, you know, uh, into the collateral for, you know, for, for ECBs, uh, transactions, so it is recognized as an asset class, where we have the proceeds of the issuance of the bonds, which are for general corporate purpose, but we link the remuneration to the pursuit of uh, sustainability goals, essentially reduction of uh, scope one GHG emissions and the development of renewables, so increase of our renewables percentage in our power generation portfolio. Well, that's really has been a game changer because we go from the green bond type of logic where you will be linking the proceeds of the issuance of a bond to or, 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 or a loan or whatever to a specific green project while with an SDG linked bond you are putting your sustainability strategy as an underlying in respect of the financial transaction. And I, my last point about communication. We have uh, um, undertaken last year 480 interactions with the local communities, institutions, with uh, ONGs. So the way we can uh, uh, really achieve the alignment between the inter stakeholders and uh, our business pur you know, purposes is uh, based on communication. We need to talk to local communities when we set up a plans. We need to interact with institutions where we need to uh, try to drive the um, public policies towards what we believe is uh, essential for the energy transition. In this respect, again, uh, the whole communication structure is definitely a fundamental tool for making our strategy being a, a concrete example of sustainable success. Thank you very much, Mr. Grisalsom. We know that Enel is uh, really committed to this uh, evolution process and, uh, and uh, such as all the big organizations in Italy, which are really drivers uh, of the changement, uh, even in a legal framework, uh, was changing in Europe and in Italy as well. So now the same question also in another sector, which is the insurance sector, which is very important too, also for the investment uh, on a global, <laughs> on a global uh, area. And so I would like to ask the same to you with regard to the coherence of your strategy and as well the communication policy, the approach, which is not uh, less important as we learn from Professor Meyer. Thank you, Mr. Cyrano. Yes, thank you. First of all, let me thank uh, myself at Sonime, Borsa Italiana and Bocconi University for organizing this uh, wonderful event. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be back here at Borsa Italiana. Um, 
I would say, first of all, let me say that uh, our sector, our industry is probably a bit less problematic from that point of view than, uh, than the one... Particularly in, in the time. Yes, <laughs> yes. Um, I would like to say just a few words. I very much appreciated Professor Hill and Professor Meyer presentation uh, about uh, uh, the way I see these problems, and then I will go about the strategy that we're following at Generali. Um, while I very much agree with uh, what's been said, I think I, I would be uh, less, uh, um, I would be a bit more skeptical about the fact of looking at these uh, problems, especially in terms of, let's say, uh, a con kind of contrast, a kind of contradiction between uh, maximizing value on one side, taking care of all the stakeholders on the other side, uh, the environment and so on. I, I tend to believe that a healthy company that, uh, and I think it was in part evident by the example that uh, Colin mentioned at the end of, he, of his presentation, a healthy company would pursue uh, the interest and the benefit and the growth of its people, of the different kind of stakeholders, uh, take care of the environment and so on, also because that contributes to maximizing value and, uh, and, uh, and benefiting the different stakeholders. So I don't see so much of a contrast, but, uh, but rather uh, complementarity. Of course, I'm talking about a healthy company, and, and I think maximizing value means doing that, pursuing that in the long term, not in the short term, taking into account risk, so in a risk-adjusted way. Uh, so that is just to give you an idea. What do we do in generali? Now, first of all, uh, sustainability is very much at the core of our uh, strategic plan, the last one being approved uh, last December. And it, runs around, it is around four pillars. I mean, a response, as you know, an insurance group is mostly active in insurance and asset management a, a, in investments. I mean, it generally is the largest institutional investor in Italy, one of the largest in Europe. So the, the, the four pillars are being a responsible insurer, a responsible investor, a responsible employer, and a responsible citizen. Just a few words about these. We have very specific targets as a responsible insurer, which means basically, for example, we, we are a founding member of the Net Zero Insurance Alliance. There are specific targets that are zero, uh, net zero carbon by 2050 which of course uh, is very long term, but we have very uh, many uh, intermediate targets. Uh, coal, for example, excluding by our insurance portfolio by 2030, every activity in the coal sector. And the more shorter term uh, or, or targets, uh, like in 2024, the end of the three-year plan, 25, I'm not going into the details, but uh, that is important to keep in mind because as uh, uh, my colleagues said they would be incorporated in the uh, incentive plans for managers. The same is true as an investor. We, we are founding members once again of the Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance. Uh, there are specific targets once again for the different uh, uh, time horizons. Uh, many of them are very ambitious. There are on top of those that are, if you want, excluding kind type of investments also proactive ones where we have, uh, uh, for example, uh, commitments to invest uh, 10 billion more uh, by 2025 in green and sustainable uh, industries and so on. So uh, very many ambitious targets that guide the entire organization. As a responsible employer, of course, we pursue uh, diversity, equity, uh, inclusiveness. Those are uh, policies that we are engaged in a different uh, manners uh, with, uh, I think that the last sense is that Professor Hill mentioned, which is the one of creating the culture. I think it's extremely important. Uh, to give you an example, I was yesterday in Venice. We, have a ni we had a nice event uh, with a number of employees from very much all over the world, more than 20 countries, from Ecuador, from Malaysia, and so on. And this was one of the events that we bring forward to uh, spread this culture of sustainability uh, across the entire organization. And, uh, and here again, for, uh, for people, for uh, remuneration, we have uh, very 
different targets uh, as a responsible employer. For example, 40% uh, uh, leadership uh, position for female by uh, 2025. So very ambitious targets that uh, we are very much committed to. As a responsible citizen, uh, we very much care not only about the E of ESG, but also the S. Again, as an example, the event of yesterday was in Venice at the site of our Human, Found Human Safety Net Foundation, which is an institution I all invite you to visit. It's in the Procuratie Vecchia in Venice that has been renovated uh, with a very significant investment by Generali, and it's now open to the public. And uh, it's a foundation that uh, helps uh, minors and refugees to find their uh, way in life, uh, also from a professional uh, point of view. Uh, I think the other part of the question, I'll try to be brief, is one, remuneration, but it's very similar uh, to what uh, uh, the NL chair just said. We, had, we have very specific targets, both on short-term and LTI, for the top top management, uh, both in terms of sustainability and diversity. Uh, I think in our case, the weight is a bit lower, 20% rather than 30, but maybe it's also related to the nature you of the You have time to increase. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, risk, we have a risk management framework that also takes into account environmental risk. Uh, very much in detail. And governance, uh, again, we have a sustainab Innovation and Sustainability Committee. Um, let me mention the fact that uh, our ESG strategy and results have been uh, recently very much recognized by uh, institutional investor, that there is an award once a year, uh, which is actually voted by 1,500 invest institutional investors around Europe a been voted number one insurance group, not only for the best CEO, best CFO, but also for the best board and the best ESG strategy and results. And I think that from a governance perspective, I just finally mentioned the fact that uh, uh, our approach and our results are also recognized by the rating agencies. Uh, one of the positive components of the evaluation is indeed governance. Uh, I think this is very important. Uh, by the way, we have a rating which is uh, equivalent. We have Moody's and, and Fitch, we are equivalent to a single A, which is above the sovereign. I think it's the best rating uh, in, uh, in Italy for a private company today. Communication, to conclude, uh, we, we, um, we have an approach whereby each function has periodic uh, interface with the relevant uh, subjects. So, for example, marketing with the customers, institutional investors with the investors, uh, uh, HR with the, with the managers. And these surveys are periodically reported to the board of directors and, of course, are taken into account for the decisions that we have to, to make. And I would stop here because we touched so many things, so we'll, we'll Thank see you very it. much. Yes, we know you're all the companies here which are here are very engaged also in the activity of the Corporate Governance Committee and the change and the evolution and the last time uh, concerning the sustainability matters. And so it is uh, a continuous dialogue on this matter, yeah. always showing the, the importance and the history and, uh, uh, by the board of directors uh, toward these matters. So uh, thank you, Mr. Cironi, and uh, thank you to Mr. Pacciani for being here. Uh, Mr. Matteo Delfante, the CEO of Poste Italiane, uh, was not able to join us, and we thank you very much, Mr. Pacciano, to have accepted our invitation to be here. He's responsible of uh, the research hub of uh, Post Italiane. And I would like to know from you the experience of Post Italiane concerning the, the strategy, the policy on uh, ESG, and as well the communication uh, policy uh, channel with stakeholders, uh, which are the, the project or the current policy on this regard. Yeah, for, thank you very much. First, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation to Sonny me also to replace uh, Mr. Delfante, also to remind other people that joined after I'm not Delfante, so <laughs> yeah. uh, whatever I'm saying is my own responsibility and not his. And uh, yeah, I, I'm leading uh, the new research hub that's been created in Post Italiane, where we are trying uh, to support uh, Post Italiane in terms of research, mostly macroeconomic things, but also looking at 
what we could define uh, uh, transition, uh, the transition, because I think if I look at the title of today, I will, instead of capitalism rev revisited, I will call it society revisited, because when I look, I joined Post Italiani one year ago, and what I was faced with was to start working on a company that suddenly I realized is a sheer and complete representation of Italy in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, spread of uh, activities, because Post Italiani was created 106 years ago, interesting enough, as one of the first network to support the Italian Carabinieri uh, to build, uh, to have a tiger line and to postal services. So, in some extent, there is something embedded into the purpose of the company 160 years ago, which is still valid today. I think Post Italiani is still perceived as, let's say, the backbone uh, of services to Italy. Pretty much we arrive everywhere. I think we have 13,000 branches and uh, we have 130, one, more than 120,000 employees and uh, 20, 22 million clients. So I think the, the, the idea, when, when I was listening to Professor Mayer, I could see that the, there is a strong identification inside the culture of post Italiani, talking about sense of purpose, between uh, the common destiny or the common future using a, um, a moniker that was very fashionable in the 80s, talking about sustainable development, our common future. There's a sense of common destiny between post Italiani and, and Italy as a country, and now, or obviously, uh, Europe. And I'm saying that because I think uh, when we, talk, we look at uh, sustainability and we look at uh, ESG factors, this is maybe where post -Itali Italiani is trying to make the difference, because you're, you're facing and dealing with a variety our customers, what IT clients, what IT stakeholders. So I think the starting point has always been the ACE of ESG. We're looking at other society, we're trying to understand what is happening, and we are there to support a lot of customers that usually do not have access to specific services. Could be financials, insurance services, could be also obviously postal services because you have a universal service mandate. So I think when, when we look at the company as a whole, I can see precisely this sense of, of identity between uh, the sense of purpose of, uh, of, the, of the management and the people working with Poste. I participated to a series of uh, panels or meetings on the territory where our managing uh, AD and series of managing directors, they travel across the country to meet the workforce and also to meet people to understand uh, directly what is happening on the a, on a ground. And I think it is very important to keep uh, this sense of communion and cohesion between what the, co the company is doing because of its mandate we still have and the sense of direction overall of the entire society. So when we look at the, at the approach on ESG, it's precisely that one. I think like all the, uh, the, um, the other panelists, we embed uh, the ESG criteria into our own activities. Our uh, industrial plan is built around the sustainable development goals. So for each part of our uh, industrial plan uh, that will go to 2024, that will be uh, continued with another one. We have this, uh, we, we mapped the sustainable development goals to our own uh, activities. Post Italiane, is uh, obviously has, uh, has his own, uh, is trying to do a lot of activities around uh, greening the fleet, because it's obviously we have, uh, I'm sure you saw around in Italy, the, the electric, uh, um, uh, the electric uh, uh, vans or the electric uh, scooters used by our postmen. We are also greening and doing a lot of activities on reducing the carbon footprint of our real estate. Uh, and this is continuing. We have a the similar target in terms of getting to uh, carbon neutrality around 2030. Then uh, depends. It's, it's always a bit. Now we speak about definition and etc. But I think the idea is that we have these clearly stated targets in our industrial plan, and we also stated this one and assessed every year in our uh, corporate responsibility report. It's the third year we issue also report that is going together with our financial side to illustrate how we adhere and we, uh, we support our path to sustainability, our adherence to ESG criteria, at the same time how we are able to uh, provide a bit more 
cohesive and coherent picture of what the company is doing in terms of uh, impact that the company is having on environmental matter, on society, and also how the governance is supporting this aspect. So apart from the activities, obviously, they are there in terms of uh, reducing the carbon footprint. And uh, there is quite a lot happening on, uh, as I said before, on, on the S part of the equation, of the ESG equation. Uh, we have, uh, um, I, I was, uh, we have quite a lot of activity in terms of uh, supporting, uh, let's start in internally, supporting the people who work for, for post in terms of training, in terms of awareness, in terms of uh, providing the skills that somebody was mentioning before, that we start s seeing that kind of lacking in some areas. So the idea is to continue internally also to create this sense uh, also, let's say double purpose. You have a purpose to serve the company because you need to have the skills. At the same time, there is a sense of uh, purpose for yourself. And I think it's very important when you look at the corporate culture that people they need to feel the sense that uh, they are, you're serving to, to targets. On one side, uh, you're supporting your people because you need the skills. You need them to be you need coders. You need people with particular skills. I think on the energy field, it's the same for us. Uh, on the, on, the, on the financial side, but at the same time, you want to give the idea that you're building on them, on people, providing them the tools to continue growing into the company uh, and also to grow themselves personally. Uh, we're doing quite a lot in terms of uh, diversity at different levels. Um, I'm very proud to say that Post Italiane has more than 50% of, of the managing directors and workforce is a female, which is, I think, is a, is a target that's been. Uh, declared recently as achieved, which is good. And you can see if you go, I think 50% of directors of post offices in, of, um, post offices in Italy, uh, more than 50% are women. Uh, and then we have uh, a very engaging relationship with all the, what we call in Italiano, la società civile, the civic society. So the, what we call it the third sector. So uh, there's quite a lot is happening on, a, on an area of uh, uh, supporting uh, charities and supporting also initiatives uh, that support, as I said before, the fact that uh, Post Italiane is the nervous system of the country. We really arrive everywhere. And we arrive everywhere, both in terms of uh, branches, both in terms of demographics. If you take the distribution of people working for us, the people that have uh, an account or business with us, is pretty much the distribution of the country. Uh, of the demographics of Italy. So I think there is quite a lot then, as I said before, to, to support, the, for example, to support the country. This is why, for example, there's quite a lot happening on the digital space. We feel entrusted uh, to support the digitalization of the country or to close the digital gap, the digital divide, which is another important aspect because if you think about the, you know, the society revi revisited of tomorrow, you cannot ignore the fact that we are moving in a world in which uh, hybrid experiences in any field will be more common. And uh, we are dealing with uh, demographic structure in Italy, which need to support people to, to how to use uh, technology. It's very important. And then uh, in terms of, of um, engagement uh, with uh, our stakeholders, apart from the traditional channels of uh, report, etc., we also have a very uh, proactive activity on uh, we have what we call a multi-stakeholder forum that happens regularly in which we listen to all the stakeholders, could be social parties, could be uh, unions, could be everybody is involved with our activities. As I said, because of the complexity of what POSTA is as a company, we have uh, a variety of businesses that, uh, that we're dealing and working in. Um, so in some extent, uh, I think this provides a bit of the picture that, uh, of the kind of activities that we have, uh, and this is all done through two directions. There's a turn from the top. The turn from the top is still, I think, important because you have this uh, capacity of the management to provide guidance and vision. I think Professor Mayer, in an article of a few years ago, spoke a lot about uh, this idea that they should have the purpose also associated to have a long-term vision or long-term view around what you're doing. So I will use a, so instead of asking yourself what I'm going to do now, what I want, where, where I want to be in two, three, four years, because it's a kind of time, uh, or even longer, you're talking about. So there's a sense of vision or tone from the top is coming different ways. 
is about uh, obviously the the other parties that spoke about uh, the fact that um, the ESG matrix or, or up adherence to sustainability matrix is also having an impact on remuneration policies. On uh, we have uh, a series of indicators ourselves. We fared very well on uh, ESG ratings at different, by different uh, suppliers. And, uh, but this is more, they say, the, the vertical structure. I think we're in Poste, and uh, allow me to say that, I, just did my, I started working for Poste one year ago. It's my first job ever in Italy. So <laughs> I, I'm a completely into completely new, two different new worlds for me. But what I found uh, is that a sense of mission is really pervaded all across the company. Uh, I, can, I can use an example that during the, the pandemic, we heard recently that, well, during the pandemic on a red zone nearby here, uh, Post Italiana continued to provide services to, to the communities, for example, supplying uh, 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 pretty much with, with the help of the Carabinieri, so going back 160 years ago, supplying uh, the pension services to people at home because they couldn't leave the home. And there was a story of a postman that was supposed uh, supplying bread to the people in some village because people couldn't leave the home, and the postman was the only person who could yes, travel <laughs> and supply. And uh, that's an example. Another example, I think, and then I will stop here in terms of uh, how we read uh, and we try to support the society as a whole in this huge process of transformation we have uh, in front of us is uh, we launched the vaccination platform uh, yeah. during the pandemic that was used uh, first again here in, uh, in Lombardia for, for, as the first uh, um, place. Uh, and again, that, that started from the capacity of the management, but also the people working for Poste to read uh, what was needed mostly in the moment by the population that we serve, this pretty much the whole of the country. And this was created from scratch uh, by our own resources in a house by Post Italiane, and we, we are very proud of that achievement because I think it shows this capacity to link uh, the sense of purpose, why I'm here as a company, a big conglomerate, but we link it to the fact that then the sense of purpose happens through, I think Professor May was saying before, actions and facts and the capacity then to provide uh, uh, solutions, which I think is where I think I can see Post is doing a lot about. Thank you very much for the, this picture, for thank you to all of you for the picture of the strategy you are currently facing now uh, in your companies. I would like to have some minutes more for the last question. We put the, uh, the question of the business purpose at the very beginning of this day because uh, uh, purpose is a further step in the evolution of companies' attitude toward the sustainable economy because emphasize companies' direct contribution to create positive externality. And with this regard, uh, Mr. Mayer, uh, remember us that uh, in Italy, uh, there is a model, uh, the business, the benefit corporation model, which uh, incorporated uh, uh, a business uh, uh, to benefit of third party. So we have the model. We have also uh, the corporate governance code promoting uh, uh, the achievement of sustainable uh, business, uh, sustainable corporate business, uh, uh, business of sex, sorry. And, uh, and so uh, I'm interested in uh, uh, asking you, uh, if you, have you considered the possibility uh, of adopting a company's purpose in the bylaws uh, of your companies or opting uh, for the benefit corporation status uh, to give a more stable legal support to your commitment uh, towards sustainability. This is, uh, uh, the debate is open on this matter in Italy. Uh, even we have uh, the benefit corporation model. Uh, the, the number of the benefit corporation is increasing year by year, but the, the dimension of this uh, corporation are uh, still uh, uh, rather medium or small size companies. And so we are asking you, who represent the big companies, if this is a model uh, about what you are reasoning or if you are looking at. Mm. 
So, Mr. Gusas. Yeah, no, no, I'll start with the, uh, replying with a, with, a, with a question that I <laughs> make to myself, first of all, which is the following. <laughs> Is it possible you know, for a company that has been uh, really reshaping the whole organization, the whole strategy towards the sustainability, that has been uh, building its uh, credibility on the market as a sustainable company, is it possible to depart from this strategy? Hmm? That's the question. The other question, ancillary to this, is uh, if you need, once we have made these choices, you need uh, something which is legally enforceable not to depart. Hmm? So I'm rephrasing your question in this way. And I think that the very straight answer to this question is uh, it is not possible for a company that has been uh, really undertaking credibly, hmm, pledging all part of its business and uh, reshaping the whole organizational model to, it is not possible really to depart from this sustainability strategy. Because once you have been uh, really undertaking a necessarily long-term perspective, you have been uh, committing yourself in respect of a vision that uh, will be lasting more than the horizon of a business plan. No, we have a 2030 vision. We have uh, a net zero target uh, by 2040. We have been uh, reinventing this in terms of uh, being credible on the market uh, through financial instruments that this strategy will be putting as an underlying. So we have uh, investors that will be looking at us saying, uh, if these guys will not be complying with the uh, sustainability target they've been putting uh, as an underlying to their financial instrument, they will be penalizing, penalized on the market. They will be you know, repricing all the debt stock, that will be a big impact, actually. So, how it is possible that we will be departing from the sustainability structure, and whether or not, again, we need legal enforcement in respect of that. I'll make you a few comments here. The first, so, the debate is whether we, once you have been uh, trying to be credible, whether you need to be subject to legal enforceability. Mm? So, in respect to that, we know there are companies that have been chosen to have uh, the purpose that we have in terms of uh, giving the old market the sense of what we do um, to, in, to amend the bylaws, you know, to introduce the purpose into the corporate bylaws. We know, of course, there are companies that have been chosen to go uh, through the um, corporate benefit um, type of scheme. But let's consider the whole legal environment in Europe. Now, we have uh, all the EU sustainability framework, which is now very pervasive. How can a company like us try to escape from that? Mm? And uh, on top of it, is it convenient for a company like us to escape from that? Mm. So do we, need, do we really need the legal enforcement in respect of that? That's, I think, is the key point. And if we look also at the legal literature on this, you know, we see Professor Ferrarini say that actually, yes, the corporate benefit scheme is fine, but if you are following, and you have to follow, the EU sustainability pattern, you apply the EU uh, corporate due diligence directive, you will be applying the EU corporate uh, sustainability disclosure, you know, reporting requirements. How can it really, do you really need to go through that pattern? Or maybe, it can be a way to um, put a green label to a part of your business rather than to the overall purpose of what you do. Mm? That's, I think, is really where we should be very careful in uh, not to uh, rely on these schemes as a way to create green rooms in a house which is not green at all. Let me go to the point on uh, whether we would like to, or whether you know, it, it, is, it makes sense to amend the bylaws. Again, I think that the bylaws can be easily amended you know, through a shareholders meeting decision, which means that if shareholders agree, you can amend the bylaws. Yes, we can do it, we cannot do it. I think it doesn't really matter whether we do it or not, because once you have made a precise choice that coherently will be really building your credibility on the capital markets 
towards institutions, towards your competitors, towards banks and insurance companies. Actually, there's no way back. And I believe that uh, once you go and protect the environment, you go and take care of biodiversity, and you do it for the interest of future generations, I'm simply mentioning an article of our constitutional chart, actually, you are complying with the purposes that today is pervasive throughout the whole legal framework that we're applying to a company like us. So I think that, again, the point is you can make a choice, you can make a different choice, but if you are credible, you don't need it. And the, the invisible hand of the market today has a different inspiration than the one that Adam Smith thought of. Yes, this is uh, Mr. <laughs> Mayer said one thing which is very important also for the benefit corporation model, which is purpose must be meaningful. Yeah. And uh, this is a key point also uh, seeing in the future uh, for the choice uh, of staying the purpose uh, on the bylaws and uh, uh, the possibility of uh, uh, making this choice uh, uh, at the core of the choices of the boards and, and the, the, the debate of the boards. So thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Cironi, what do you think about uh, 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 yeah. including uh, a precise statement on the purpose or a dairy to the business corporation model? Well, I think my answer would be uh, relatively similar to the one of <laughs> Mr. Chrysostomo. Um, as I mentioned, I mean, Generali is um, engaged, is strongly committed uh, in a path which is uh, designed in a strategic plan that has, as I mentioned, sustainability as its, as its uh, key pillar, right? And... Um, I think we have a, and we are recognized as such. I mean, we see ourselves, at least in this respect, uh, a bit of a role model. And as I mentioned earlier, we are in some way recognized as such by investors, by rating agencies, and so on. Uh, I think there is uh, a very clear purpose. I mean, as an insurance, generally is 190 years old. And the, let's say, the social function of insurance was... Uh, very much well recognized by its founders. I mean, the one of uh, protecting people, companies, businesses, families, and promote economic progress and so on. I think that if I look at my short experience, because I've been chair of Generali for just a bit less than five months, and uh, I met many different people from many different countries. Of course, I was impressed by the fact they're very highly qualified professionals, they're very committed, they have significant expertise. Most of them have very significant international experience. But one thing that struck me the most is probably the sense of pride, the sense of belonging to the group. It's quite impressive. I mean, when you talk to uh, people from the group, uh, they, they feel this uh, pride of being part of the Generali group that has such a strong tradition, has buildings everywhere <laughs> and whatever, right? And I think this is a great advantage because... Uh, at the end of the day, a service company like uh, our group uh, is made up of what people do. It's made up of people entirely. I mean, we don't have factories. On, and, and I think that... Uh, uh, so, as I mentioned earlier, making reference to Professor Hill's statement, final statement, we have this promotion of culture that goes in that direction. So, would making a change in the Articles of Association really make a change. I mean, I think we can refer to the water company that uh, Colin mentioned earlier. I mean, we don't see that as a necessary and uh, useful step right now. Uh, we will probably have future discussions at the board level, but so far we continue with our strategy. Thank you. The same question to you, just to... Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, the short answer is no, we are not uh, at the moment <laughs> considering that. Is it? I could stop there, <clears throat> I could say, maybe say something more. In, in reality, using a word was very fashionable in the uh, 90s. Synthetically, we are, uh, I think, a benefit company, if you look at Post Italiane, for the kind of mandate that we have in terms of a social mandate we have from, uh, from the government, universal, using always the universal service as an example, because it's then 
is a basis through which all the other services are supplied. Uh, and, uh, and we are because of the, of the fact that we look also at the impact on return on society as a whole of the clients we serve in a, in a very granular way. I think it's at the center also of our, we have a mission, uh, we have a statements in our, in our industrial plan in which we state clearly that we are there to support the economic, social, and also digital transformation of the country inside the boundaries of uh, what is acceptable from, uh, obviously from a sustainability point of view. We also have, uh, from the point of view, we also have, let's say, a role to play on the financial stability of the country because the role we play with our, um, with our also activity uh, with the Poste Vita, with the Banco Posta, with our SG area. So we also have that kind of aspect. So from a, from a certain point of view, I think synth synthetically, we are in the space. Then if you look uh, more at the, at, the, at the fact that how this can be done uh, officially or through the governance is a completely different matter. Well, I think we pride ourselves, we consider ourselves to be a company also looking at the, continuously at how benefits and produce a value that is not only the financial return, but also how we measure the impact uh, on, uh, on, on, on our clients and in society. And uh, maybe this is another aspect I would like to touch, uh, because I think uh, also echoing also the other panelists said, uh, I think the last year, they said, the, they said the series of pandemic, Ukrainian war, and now the energy crisis and the climate change extreme events. In some extent, I think they touch all of us in a way or the other, because uh, if you look at the drought in uh, Europe, especially Northern Italy, or if you look at uh, uh, also the, um, the inflation crisis we're suffering now, I think if it's not uh, the society, the company is looking more at these aspects, reality is telling us that we, there are aspects that we need to look more and more carefully. One is climate change, the other one is also uh, let's say suitability of what we're offering, the financial stability of our clients, and social et problem as well. Social yes. problems. So I think in reality, reality is telling us that it's time to focus even more on some of the aspects that are the core of the benefit society concept. Thank you. Thank you very much for your contribution to this discussion. Thank you for your attention. Now we can uh, enjoy our coffee break. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we